On the Tape is presented by CME Group, where risk meets opportunity, and iConnections, reimagining how the investment industry connects. A very warm welcome to the On the Tape podcast. I am Guy Adami, that's Dan Nathan, and joining us back from vacation, the great Danny Moses. Danny Moses, how are you? What did I miss? Did I miss some action? You know, it's funny you say that, and we're going to get into that in a second, but before, I just want to say hello to Dan Nathan, Dan. Hi, Guy. This is, as I mentioned on the tape podcast, and stick around because after the three of us chat about the markets, we have a conversation with managing director of RW Baird, the great Ben Callow. You know Ben from his coverage of Tesla and other stocks, so I'm sure that will be an animated conversation, Dan Nathan. But as we're sitting here today on a Thursday afternoon, by the way, we have found ourselves on the Instagram, Dan. Yeah. yeah. You are what? I'm Dan's Nathan. Dan, S. Dan Nathan. S. Nathan. Yeah. You're Guy Dada. I'm, I'm Guy Adami, yes. Guy Dada. I'm not sure if Danny Moses has found us. Danny, have you found your way onto the gram? I'm on. I'm on Instagram. Um, I haven't had my coming out party yet on it, so I'll work on that okay, with you guys. Okay, please. I think that's important because we need to we need to enrich our social media presence. But earlier today, and when I say today, we tape our podcast on Thursdays. I want to be crystal clear. Yeah. Thursday, April 4th. Now, you're listening to this most likely Friday the 5th or maybe on Saturday the 6th. I don't know. But earlier today, Thursday, I put out on the gram, today is a day where you could see a big reversal in the broader market. And people looked at me like, you're out of your, you're out of your mind, which is true. The S&P 500 on Thursday, which is again today, traded up to 52 56 and change. As we're sitting here right now, Dan Nathan, the S&P is 5176 and change. That, my friends, is what? A good old-fashioned reversal. It's a good old-fashioned reversal. Now, I'm not saying that to pat myself on the back. Trust me, I'm wrong <laughs> more than I'm right. But I mention that because over the last couple of weeks, Danny Moses, and I go back to March 8th, which was a Friday, we saw some huge intraday reversals in individual stocks, not necessarily the broader market, but on some individual stocks. Technicians call what we saw on that particular day an engulfing pattern, a key reversal. And I will tell you, since that day, although the market's traded sideways, a little higher, a little lower, some of these individual stocks a little higher, a little lower, that has not been breached, Dan Nathan. So yeah. as we sit here, I ask you, are we on the precipice of something, by the way, I'll also mention before I shut up for a second that we have a VIX with a 15 and a half handle for the first time in quite some time. Yeah, and interestingly, you know, we have this move index back towards 100. That thing had fallen off the bottom right of its chart. So that's a U.S. Treasury um, measure of volatility there. And so when you talk about this intraday reversal guy that we're seeing right now, Thursday into the close, we have the all important March jobs report tomorrow morning. I love that. Do you have to say all important? Yeah, a hundred percent. Not you. Do. you. I know one. Like everybody one. says yeah. the all important. Yeah. Okay. And sorry. so I guess why is that that report important? Well, the market sold off today because your boy uh, Neil Kashkari. Uh, oh, whoa, 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 whoa! Stop for a second. Yeah. yeah okay. Yeah. Just stop for one second. Not your boy. <laughs> There was, a, there was an episode on CNBC back in the day. Aaron Burnett, by the way, is a very dear friend of mine. Yeah. Indulge me for a second. Sure. Okay? I knew Aaron's husband before she knew him. I worked with her husband, Dave Rubalata. Is that a, what they call that? Doxing. I'm not doxing him because it's out there in the <laughs> public domain. Yeah. Dave worked with us at J. Aaron and Company, and he was sort of our accountant. He used to come up to the desk. What should I do? He wound up going to NYU, I believe, and then he had a storied career in Wall Street. Nice. So Dave met Aaron at Citibank. They got married. Okay, so guy, what are you talking about? Aaron Burnett on her show one morning had a guest on. Had a guest on. Neil Kashkari. No. no. The gentleman's name was Hugh Johnson. Yeah. And she called him Huge Johnson. Yeah. She said, we're here now with Huge Johnson. Neil Cash Carey, his name isn't Huge Johnson, oh, I but see he what is you're a doing there. Huge Johnson. Okay. But yes, you're going to mention the fact that on this day, it was the market turned on comments from him. So interestingly, so so Cash Carey got himself a little bit of a reputation as like the eternal dove, right? As, as a, a Fed governor. And now he seems to be like the eternal hawk. Bit of a hawk. Yeah. So there's hawkish commentary that turned the S&P 55 handles. We haven't seen that sort of move. Um, in a while. But interestingly enough, Danny, we have yields. Okay. So the 10-year yield 
is at 430 right now. It's not even budging. So if Kashkari could move the stock market intraday like mm-hmm. that, wouldn't you think the, the 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 treasury market would move, yields would move a little bit, especially when we saw yields got going earlier on this week and what it did to stocks at that point. And I think this is what's different, at least this week, in, in, in a lot of sideways price action with some intraday volatility, is that the perception of higher yields is really sinking in. The notion that we are going to price out rate cuts, at least in the summer, is is really kind of making its way at least into the stock market psyche a little bit, Danny. Are we clear? Crystal clear. <laughs> uh, all right. A few good men right there, just to just to be clear on yes. that. Um, yes, it should scare people from a bond volatility and a stock volatility perspective when just words can be taken out either in context or out of context by Fed governors. If you are buying and selling this market based upon the expectation of whether the Fed's going to cut in June or July or in September, you're doing it wrong. As long as you own companies with good fundamentals, you take advantage of sell-offs like this and buy them, right? On the flip side of that is when you get something dovish, you take advantage and sell when it goes up. But the fact that you can move a market like this should scare everybody. And that volatility, I think we all agree, is here to stay. We've said that stocks moving up, markets moving up in a volatile manner are just as, quote, dangerous or as unsettling as things moving down. So yes. And what does the Fed have to do? Every time we see 10-year yields creep their way to that 450 level, and I'll explain why I believe the 10-year yields are actually trading lower now, because I believe if you go higher for longer, it will have impact on the economy that will slow and 10-year yields will come in because you're self-fulfilling recession. That's neither here nor there. But the Fed is forced uh, to come out when rates move high because of how much issuance the Treasury has Mm -hmm. to make to be overtly, quote, dovish. We're here for you. I just want to remind you that we're here for you. And they do this every so often, but there is a pattern to this. And at some point, when that doesn't matter anymore and people see through it, that's your danger sign, to your point. And I've always said, the, the well, I will be most bearish is when tenure yields trade down and the market trades down. That combination, when you see that thing, which will make no sense at first, since everyone's so obsessed with the tenure, that's my fear point. Or that's when I'm going to say, okay, now you should be worried because what is your catalyst? So if every, every one of these models is predicated on, oh, 10 year yields are coming in, quant says buy, go buy stocks and go. What if that breaks? So a lot going here, but listen, huge jobs number tomorrow, but it's just a number. If it's 220, is the market going to trade down because it's 20,000 higher? If it's 180, does it trade up because it's uh, nonsense? So bottom line is, Fed is the inflation stickier than we thought. It will abate at some point. It's certainly done, I think, going up a lot. But all the Fed is doing with this rhetoric is inflating assets. When I say assets, commodities, which are actually having an impact on the consumer. Well, let's there, talk- I said a lot. No, you are correct. And let's talk about that for a second, because there's a scene in A Bronx Tale. You recall the movie? Of course, yeah. The great Chaz yeah, Palminteri. Get big Yankee fan, by the way. De Niro. One of the many reasons. I- yes, Robert De Niro as well. Great movie. Now use can't leave. Exactly. Is that what you're- now Bang. use can't leave. And I think that's what we found ourselves in. And I'm glad that you mentioned some of these underlying commodities, because as we sit here, Danny Moses and Dan Nathan, I know you have thoughts. You have a gold market that seemingly now on a daily basis is making an all time high. And we'll talk about gold miners in a second and why I think the stocks can play catch up. You also have crude oil trading at levels, Dan, that we haven't seen since September, October of last year. You've had this very quiet stealth rally in crude that nobody wants to talk about. Meanwhile, you have an OIH, which has gotten on its horse, and you have the XLE comprised basically of those three main st- stocks, Chevron, Conoco, Phillips, and Exxon, has also gotten on its horse. And I'll throw in copper and some of the soft commodities, but let's focus right now on the two that I mentioned. Yeah, I, I guess the most important part about it, you can put it all together, right? You can say the dollar has firmed up. You say that yields at least, you know, like have, have basically firmed up because if you're starting to price out cuts, right, in mm-hmm. the near term, so you have upward pressure, at least, you know, kind of uh, neutral pressure on yields, then if you have the commodity upward pressure... I'm looking at crude oil at 86 bucks right now. There was an article, I don't know if you guys saw this, in the Wall Street Journal today. It was one of those interactive sort of things. It was actually doing $100 worth of groceries in 2019 and basically what you get for that in 2024. Mm-hmm. And you're going to have to basically cut out $37 worth of, of groceries that you would have been able to oh my, get. Oh, yeah. Oh my God. So, so really? I guess, 
So this is where this is where I, I want to bring this conversation to back to the S and P 500. So if we have all of these inflationary pressures, at some point that is going to weigh on corporate margins, yes. right? And if corporate margins are going to start to decrease as we kind of get a sense for Q2 earnings and basically maybe what the balance of 2024 S&P earnings might look like, we know that right now consensus hats for up 12% year over year at a time where all of those inflationary pressures are higher than they've been in a very long time. And most importantly, it's the narrative around them. Because if you think back to where the stock market really started getting going in mid-December is when we were pricing in six rate cuts in 2024. And I guess what, Kashkari, your man. No, no, no. I want to be, because someone might be coming man. in right not now. Someone might be man. walking not into a room man. and they hear got Dan man. Nathan Sorry. say to Guy Adami that he's your I want to be clear. Not your man. No. Not your man. But the point here. Johnson. Huge Johnson. The point here is that uh, the S&P at some point is going to have to start thinking about, okay, are we hit uh, peak margins? Do we see any economic slowdown? And what does that kind of mean for S&P 500 earnings? And I just say that we were at 52.50 in the S&P about three hours ago, yeah. and we're at 51.75 right now, and we have a 10-year stuck right here. So that, that's my only point. At some point, valuation will come into play, Danny. For sure. Um, and again, to have this market move. And when you talk about energy prices, you talk about oil, which has a direct effect on the consumer. You talk about stocks in the market. Let's talk about Walmart, right? I'm not going to go into it. This was the, this was the theme. If you got to spend more money on food and you need to buy some other stuff, that's where you're going. So Walmart's been capturing market share kind of from that middle income consumer that's had to kind of step down. So that's what my point is. You can find yourself owning some of these names or just kind of retailers or things like that because of what's going to happen or what's been happening here within the energy sector. But when you look at oil and gasoline specifically, the impact that that's going to have on the consumer, Dan, to your point, not only does it hurt discretionary income, but your point about those input costs and all things that are going to go into the S&P, it does hurt March. And so I think we're caught in this bind of, you know, you're damned if you do, damned if you don't, if you're the Fed. If you want to maintain this dovishness, and you're going to spike a rally in all these commodities, which have a direct impact on the consumer and on input costs, then you gotta, you're gonna pay the price somewhere. So I think that's kind of where we are. And again, on this gold guy, and I know we can get into this here, what is it telling us? And you know, I'd love to ask you the question, what is gold rallying like this telling us of what's going on in the faith kind of in the, in the markets? Fair, I'm glad you asked me and I'll attempt to answer. So as I've said a number of times, you don't need to listen to me at all. However, when somebody like Stan Druckenmiller makes comments like he did in February, when he talks about getting into gold mining stocks, you say something, hmm, that's interesting. What does he see? You don't have to agree with him, but when somebody of that magnitude speaks, you got to listen. Then earlier this week, we heard David Einhorn on with Scott Wapner from the Irisone conference, correct. I believe. Am I correct? Yeah. Talking about his position in not only gold, but physical gold, Danny Moses, something that you talk about in the form of PHYS and other things, and his, and his reasonings why. And I think basically what he said is sort of mirroring what we talk about, these debt levels that have gotten to levels that are unsustainable without question, and his concern that central banks have basically, their hand is no longer firmly on the rudder of their respective economies. And I say that through the lens of not only the United States, but we talked about Japan, Danny, when nobody was talking about Japan and what was going on with their currency and the fact that the yen has weakened in a meaningful way after they raised rates for the first time in 17 years. So you have all these odd things happening and all roads lead to gold. And gold has been rallying with interest rates going up, which historically it doesn't do. And it's been rallying with the dollar going higher, which historically it does not do. And oh, by the way, it's been rallying as Bitcoin has seemingly found a bit of a top. So they have seemingly decoupled as well. So there are a lot of reasons to like gold. People say it's toward the end of, the, end of its rope here. I'll come back and say, I think we're in the very early innings of the gold market. I agree. And I think we've seen what, correct me if I'm wrong, a three to four trillion dollar move in the global gold market somewhere in that mm -hmm. realm. It's not small. If we were sitting at 11 or 12 trillion roughly when we were at 18 or 1900, we're here at 2300. That's, you know, I can do the math. I think that's about right. So that's a big move. And I agree with you. Nobody owns it. You know, I think that you're starting to see it more, it's in the news flow a little bit more, but it's not even there yet. So I don't know what the Investopedia mentions are, it, you, know, it, you know, at this point, there's a lot of ways to play it. Like you said, I play the PHYS, but you are seeing the tail on some of these ETFs 
like JNUG and GDX, mm-hmm. GDXJ, JNUG, all this, all this stuff where you're starting to see the tail. Most stocks, those things are up 80 to 100% here over the last couple months. So a lot of volatility. I'm sure it'll have a maybe healthy pullback at some point, but it should scare people, or at least not scare people. People should be asking the question and learning more about it. And Guy, your, your point on Japan and the yen, and again, we, we hate to get wonky and should you care? Probably not. But if you wake up one day and the yen is through 154 or 155 and S&P futures are down 130 and you're asking yourself, why? Why does that? Why are those two correlated at all? And it all goes back to what you said. It's gold. It's the faith in the central banks. And if you talk about Japan, what do they need to do in order to shore up their people have saw through kind of what they did with the end of NERP saying that they're still dovish. Try the BOE in the fall of 22, what they did. So again, we're still in this experiment. I don't want to be bearish. I just want people to understand you need to take time to figure, just try to put this puzzle together so you're not caught off guard if and when this volatility does hit these various assets. Right. And you, you guys have been talking about the, the the yen weakness. And, you know, one of the things that, you know, just to kind of break it out a second here, Guy, and maybe you can kind of expand on this, is like this has been a multi-decade trade yeah. where you basically are, are basically selling over there and, and basically taking the proceeds to fund higher yielding assets usually over here. And so when you talk about this yen carry trade, that's it. That's the thing. It's been a source for a lot of liquidity in our markets and whether they're bubbly or whether they're not, right? So you take that away, that's just one of the sort of incremental buyers. Um, I'll just say this, Danny, you also said something. I just want to push back for a second because I, I know you don't mean this. You know, tomorrow's number, again, this is, you're probably listening to this on Friday. So the March jobs report is just one number. And, and that's what you said. But right now we're kind of at this point where I think investors um, have, the macro has been a good tailwind for them, right? If you think about it, because we had this period where, you know, the Fed clearly articulated why they were raising interest rates. The stock market was basically going along for the ride as yields were going higher. The economy kept on chugging along better than everybody expected, right? So I guess the point is, and we use this term or the Fed uses this term, long and variable lags, right, of monetary policy. Well, if all of a sudden you go from rate cuts going from six to three to one to zero to maybe pricing in hikes because inflation is stoked by some geopolitical event, something we haven't seen. Guy, I said this on Fast Money last night, and I'm just curious. We didn't really kind of bat it around. We are talking about, okay, so the Fed has lots of room to cut, right? In the event that we have a weakening economy or something like that. Oh, yes, because I know what you're saying. In in the scope of we have had zero interest rates yeah. before. Yeah. So in that context, the answer is yeah, theoretically, yeah. yes. But continue. My, my, and my point was that in, in both instances, I remember in the last couple rate hiking cycles, we're like, well, this gives the Fed more room. We did not have inflation That's, at levels. There okay, you go. There you're going to go. And then the one point I was going to make about 2001, about 2007, 8, and then obviously about 2020, the thing that caused them to cut dramatically was something that nobody could have foreseen. And so that's the one issue that I think, again, I think the Fed's in a much more difficult spot right now, even with Fed funds at five and a half percent because of the inflationary uh, you know, backdrop that we have. And then this is a great conversation that we had with David Rosenberg of Rosenberg Research last week. And I, I don't know, Danny, if you had a chance to listen to it. But the point is, he keeps harping on valuations, and he's probably right. But 99% of the market watchers out there are saying, well, what are you talking about? 21 times. We just had the Fed ratchet up their expectations for GDP. The U.S. is the best neighborhood and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. You know, all that sort of stuff. But it's the things that we can't foresee. And I'm not saying that you have to start trading against the unknowns, but make no mistake about it. Things are expensive, and the backdrop is fragile. Listen, I was obviously being sarcastic when I made the comment about the jobs number because I look at it this way. Let's make it more extreme. Let's make it 250 or 150. Yeah. 250. Well, Fed rate cuts get pushed out, but guess what? The economy is still strong. It supports current valuations. 150, to your point. Oh, rate cuts get pulled forward, but hold on. Maybe the market is expensive, but does a Fed rate cut really, quote, do anything? Mm-hmm. And so really, that's the point that I'm making. And that the, the point that I'm making is, you got to use those opportunities of those massive swings of either those numbers to, you know, cr- to call in or to expand your portfolio based upon that stuff. That's my point is, is that it's, it's, it's really ridiculous, but you have to pay attention to it. Well, so. no, the market absolutely trades on it. And I'll be crystal clear. I was somebody that thought last year that into the fall of last year, you'd start to see a meaningful uptick 
in the unemployment rate. That did not happen. As a matter of fact, at one point, either earlier this year or late last year, it actually ticked down. But you go and look at the numbers, and now you think 10 out of the last 12 months, revisions have been significantly negative. At a certain point, that's going to catch up. And you did see the unemployment rate tick up the last reading. Yeah. I don't think the market is prepared, just my opinion, for a significant move. When I say significant move, a stair-step move higher in the unemployment rate. Because I think the initial reaction would be, oh, that's good. That's going to give the Fed some cover. But then the reality is going to be, wait a second. This is a market. This is an economy that's predicated on, one, people having jobs. Two, those people having access to credit, which, by the way, has been contracting. And three, those people spending money because they feel good about things. So throw that in the mixer yeah. and see where it comes up because I'm telling you, rate cuts are not going to assuage the concerns of those people. All right, let's bring it back to the stock market here for a second here and some some maybe individual names. Guy, you just mentioned that Marth Ace period. Okay, so we're coming on maybe a month. And, and what was going on there, it was like the height of the AI, Gen yep. AI frenzy, specifically in the semiconductor stocks. You talked about that intraday reversal seemingly for no reason. I remember there was some options activity. There was a huge role in NVIDIA, meaning somebody was taking some profits on some calls and rolling them um, up and out. And whatever happened on the backside of that caused a reversal. And it was this snowball effect, right? So it was maybe a dealer hedging, but then other folks saw some selling and then they just started selling everything else in the space. You had uh, NVIDIA closed down 10% from its intraday highs, which was amazing. And I think you and I both, you know, tried to put a bit of a fine point on that. A few weeks later, you know, we were kind of threatening those levels, but we didn't break out and we didn't make new highs. Well, here we are today on this reversal day. And I think it's important to note that AMD has had a 10% intraday reversal. Yeah. It's down 7.5%, 8% or so. NVIDIA is down 2.5%. And so to me, what's happened in this period is that you might have seen a broadening out away from some of the semis that have driven a lot of these early gains in, in 2024. Um, but right now, those are still going to be the leadership, in my opinion. So I think that that analogy guy is a really good one. Just intraday, we've seen Microsoft sell off 2%. We've seen Google sell off 2.5%. We've seen seen uh you know tesla which was up at one point over five percent is is up uh, you know a little less than two percent or something so some very big big moves in some of the biggest names in the market and you could say oh well you know energy is hanging in there and financial and banks are hanging in there and this and that whatever they just don't add up it All just right. doesn't matter let me just say this again so as as you mentioned we do this on thursdays you can hear it on a friday so it was march 8th was a friday as well and i've been pretty consistent about this and thank you for bringing it up that day for technicians, people that chart things and look at the things through basically patterns that have been prevalent throughout the history of charting, they see certain patterns. The pattern that we saw specifically that day on NVIDIA, and I mentioned it because at the time it traded up to, I think, a market cap of north of $2.3 trillion or so. The reversal on that Friday from peak to trough, that stock lost almost a quarter of a trillion dollars of market cap. For context, I think there are only 60 or 65 companies in the world that have a market cap of that size in the first place. But somehow it seemed normal to most people. And I've been flagging that ever since. And you also mentioned the fact that there were a couple days where we seemingly challenged that prior high on that day, yep. but we never got there. And as we're sitting here today, we're almost $100-ish lower than that intraday high on March 8th. That is something to watch. That has not been broken. And I will say again, we might come back here two months from now and say, holy shit, guys, you were right about that March 8th intraday reversal. And we're seeing it now in broader market reversals. So when you see extreme moves like this, that is typically indicative of something going on. And again, as we're sitting here, I'm watching the VIX now tick up north of 16, Danny Moses. So it's clear that something is in the works. You know, I forgot to mention to you guys yesterday, uh, I had the benefit of spending the day with the one and only Mike Wilson from Morgan Stanley, who was down in Florida with some Morgan Stanley private client guys that I know when his flight was delayed. So we had, you know, kind of a heart to heart over a beer and we kind of looked at each other and I said, I'm going to tell you what I got wrong. You tell me what you got wrong. And to the point you made, Guy, a few minutes ago about a recession or job slowing, I said to, to Mike, plain and simple, I go, in the fall of last year, I was so convinced that by the second quarter of 2024, and maybe by the first quarter, that we would certainly see signs of a recession, signs of economic slowdown, and dead wrong. And so if that's the thesis, the lens of Now, 
That being said, the other thing that we talked about was private credit. And I know it's talked about ad nauseum. We don't have to go into it. People know who the players are in it. God bless them all. Al Rock, Blackstone, Apollo, Aries, all these guys. Great. Um, the point, the Fed actually wrote a great um, article on it. I want to say in February, we'll put it in the show notes, the size of this market. It's the other thing that I underestimated. And he admitted that he underestimated the power that the non-bank financial system has had and still has. And by the way, I'll tell you, these are covenant light. It is what it is. But you won't see any problems with those loans, probably, unless we go into a recession. So I wanted to highlight those two things. And the last thing I want to say about Mike Wilson, and I asked for permission to talk about this, is he decided to go to the airport at 5 o'clock yesterday in Fort Lauderdale when I told him the Met game's canceled. You're probably not getting into LaGuardia. I think you're making a mistake. You should stay. He landed at 3 a.m. in LaGuardia. <laughs> so he made a major error on that part. So anyway, I wanted to kind of round that out in this conversation. We all make so. errors. And l let me say this real quick. Heart to heart for you fans out there of the show, the great Robert <laughs> Wagner, who, by the way, is still with us at 94 years of age. Dan, I know you were a fan of that show. And, of course, Stephanie Powers played his wife, Jennifer Hart. Yeah. You don't care. Maybe we'll cut this out. Please don't. But if you're looking for individual names on everything that Danny just was talking about and I was mentioning I still believe in my heart of hearts that gold GDX or the miners, either Newmont Mining, Agnico Eagle Mines, or what Danny mentions it all the time, PHYS, which as we sit here, I think is at its all-time high, that those are underappreciated. Again, a stock market that's effectively, today notwithstanding, at its all-time high, the underlying commodity at its all-time high, and some of these gold miners are still half of their prior all-time high. So the catch-up trade in these mining stocks, I believe, Dan Nathan, is going to be fast and furious. Yeah, but listen, can we just break this out for break a second? Break it out, So baby. when I listened to um, David Imhorn yesterday with Wapner, okay, to me, what was really evident is that this is a calamity trade, okay? So David Einhorn has talked about, so Greenlight Capital, you know, he's missed some moves like, like, like the rest of us here and there or whatever. And so not only is he loading up on GLD, he's loading up on gold bars. He's a, This is not... It's not like buying a stock because you think the prospects are better. You're buying this risk asset because you think something else is going to go pear-shaped. Fair. So when I think about the miners guy, okay, I say to myself, well, these are operating companies. Mm -hmm. These are companies that need to get orders or whatever the hell it is, right? Like this, whatever. They have expenses. They have input costs. They're subject to interest rates. I find the miners much less interesting than buying the calamity trade. And right here, I think the miners are up about 20%. Is that so from, from those recent lows or whatever? I'd probably rather buy Bitcoin for the reasons Ooh. that you guys are saying to buy or continue to be long of gold here. Because to me, if there is a calamity trade, then it's... It's going to be expressed in that sort. The GDX may go up. You know, we talked about silver earlier in the week in the market call. That may go up too, but they're really representing something different, right? Like to me, they're, 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 it's kind of like the CDS trade in a way. Yeah, I, I would say that I hear that point, but I would say that the Bitcoin has a lot more retail exposure and kind of fast money exposure than gold does. It's not to say both can't be volatile, but Bitcoin's going to have a lot more volatility and the stock stands surrounding crypto that we've talked about, you know, the coin bases of the world, right, that are kind of out there that or the or the data, the miners themselves for Bitcoin miners themselves, that whole group is very, very volatile. So certainly you can play that way. I just feel like you're looking for a lot more volatility that if things do calm down again, those may sell off a lot more than gold these levels just from a supply demand perspective. But point point well taken. Yeah, no, but I wouldn't buy those stocks for those reasons. I I I, I would no, equate I, I would equate those those Bitcoin proxies as the miners in a way. And the one thing I'll just say earlier in the week when we had that nasty sell off, there was a one day NASDAQ. I know it's nasty. It was down 1% or something like that. Did you see that Bitcoin was down 7%? So so it yep. seems to be very positively correlated to the semi gen AI trade Great. and that sort of thing. So to me, that's the one differential. Your gold is the pure play. Danny Moses, earlier I mentioned in, in a very loud and vociferous <laughs> way, that I'm no fan of Neil Kashkari, and there are a number of reasons why. There's another person that I've really never been a fan of. I don't underestimate her intelligence. I don't underestimate her want to do good, but I find her to be um, ponderous at best and just annoying at worst. And that individual is headed over to, to, to uh, China, oddly enough. Thoughts on our, the great Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen? She's actually in China. Um, I think it was planned. But again, I always find this coordination when rates start to move up 
what's her job? Her job is to issue the debt of the government and to keep rates at bay and pals to keep everybody calm. So there's a method to the madness here. And she's in China and basically going after them, as we have been threatening tariffs potentially to say, you guys are making stuff too cheap, like solar or electric vehicle, and you're exporting them and you're killing everyone else's business. I don't agree with any of the politics in China. Let me just separate that for a second. But when we were big into globalization and all the U.S. multinationals had had factories that still do in China and the low cost, of, it was so deflationary at the time. And it's great. And everybody now we're hammering them for the mm-hmm. fact that they're trying to grow their economy and do things to, so they can survive and make money. And we're coming after them for that. It's a lot deeper than that. I'm just kind of pointing out the obvious here. So she's on a five day run there. But let's talk about China's ownership of U.S. treasuries, Japan's ownership of U.S. treasuries. China, you know, has dropped from, I think, of 11.6 percent of foreign U.S. treasuries to 9.9. You know, it's still a lot, but it's dropping. Same with Japan. It's dropping. UK is growing, Canada's growing. We need these countries, though. We can only push them so far, right? China, we need to still basically own our stuff and help help us, basically. So we have to be partners with them in some capacity. I think this is an important timing perspective in the sense of how much debt we do have to actually issue and how important that relationship is, both from an economic perspective as a partner. We can hate them all we want, but they're our partner in, in a lot of economic activity. So we'll see what happens. I don't know how effective it's going to be. But the last thing you should want if you're worried about inflation, in my opinion, is tariffs and hard talk on Mm -hmm. Chinese manufacturing and so forth, because that's only going to increase our costs. Again, I'm I'm playing the long game. I want what's right in the world. I'm happy to favor the U.S. in that regard. But just think about the implications on that in terms of the economics of it. Well, it's interesting you mentioned that because earlier this week on CNBC's Fast Money, great show, Dan Nathan. Yeah, it's pretty good. 5 p.m. Eastern time. Yeah, Monday through Friday. Monday through Friday. Yeah. We had Stephen Roach on the show, oh, and yeah. he's probably forgotten more about China than 99.5% of the population. And Tim Seymour correctly, and if Tim didn't do it, I would have done it, asked him a question along th- that vein, along those lines, in terms of, you know, is she there basically to talk about issuance and their ability to basically buy our debt and those types of things? And he seemingly dismissed it a bit. Now, again, I'm not suggesting he's right or wrong, but... You know, he didn't think it was that big a deal. I happen to agree with you, Danny Moses. Like, I believe that one of the reasons she's over there is exactly that. I don't think that's something that comes out in terms of the notes or ever how they um, position it. But it's clearly something that's got to be top of mind because we're at a point now in April of 2024 where I still believe there's about $9 trillion worth of issuance that needs to come to market over the next, I don't know, nine or ten months. Now, again, I'm not saying the U.S. is – that's not my point. People will buy our debt. But to your point, Danny, it's the rate at which they buy our debt that's important. And with these issuances coming, uh, I get the feeling these bond auctions, again, just my opinion, are going to get worse and worse. Listen, there's one other sector which we can talk about, which you know we talk about why you should care about government debt deficits and so forth is – Obviously, you saw what happened in the healthcare stocks. United Healthcare, Humana on this Medicare reimbursement rate that instead of going up was flat year over year. Humana stock was down how much? You know, certainly I think it was like 15, 20 percent guy or something in that in that, in well, that realm. I mean, and real quick in terms of Humana, and I'm gra- glad you brought that up. Not a small company, even with the sell off. This is still a thirty eight billion dollar company. And I say even with the sell off, this was a stock that I think at one point was north of $550, I think, in the fall of 2022. You started to have a sell-off and then an additional sell-off on the back of this news. And now you're talking about a stock that's either side of $310. And you throw on top of that a name like UNH and some of these other names in the space. And that's obviously having an impact. But please continue. No, my point is that you've got to start to think about these things and the impact that industries and sectors that are relying on government spending, at least to a degree, that's how sensitive this can be. So if we start to you know, increase taxes. I'm really getting out in the future here in terms of how we're going to fix this fiscal problem that we might have that we don't care about at the moment. And that's fine. You don't have to care. But you care when you own Humana and you don't even know what you own. You own or you own the Dow and United Healthcare obviously is a huge component of it because we know how that's a bad index. Anyway, but my point is that start paying attention to these things because they're going to matter more and more. Now, lest you folks think I'm negative about everything, Neil Cash Carey and Janet Yellen and the fate, all this stuff, okay? I'm not. I'm not a hater, Dan Nathan. As a matter of fact, like 12 million other citizens in this country, I watched the Iowa Hawkeyes women team beat the LSU Tigers 
women team to get into the Final Four. Twelve million. Did you hear that number? Twelve. Why do I mention? Because that is a staggering number, Danny Moses. The women's game, in my opinion, and Dan disagrees with me on this, and that's what makes markets. I'll watch them play every single day over the men. With that said, there are things happening in terms of the gambling uh, sector that lends itself to these conversations and to some of the viewership over the last couple of weeks, Demo. Yes. While I was away, there was some, um, I guess, some news out on the sector that various states want to ban um, gambling on individual prop bets in college, right? And there's some scrutiny coming in and what, what gambling is doing. Certainly gambling can be a problem for people, but the sector had run so much, it was a good, you know, I guess it was a good excuse for some profit taking. That being said, it's still in a big sector bull story. You guys know how I felt about these names for a long time. The Flutter, which is FanDuel, DraftKings, and Genius Sports, which I'll get into in, in a second. But bottom line is that game guy that you're talking about that had 12 million eyeballs on it at least was the most wagered game in women's sports history. But not only that, it showed a sign that women are also getting involved in the gambling. And FanDuel you know, basically said so. So it was a huge just kind of, I think, coming out party and just gives you an idea how big this market can be. So the stocks have started started to recover from some of that you know sell-off um, that had occurred. And one name in particular, which reported earnings recently and has had a huge overhang because a large private equity owner has been selling is Genius Sports, G-E-N-I. Without going, you guys know how I feel. I've talked about it, you know, this name obviously on the show before, about a 1.3 billion market cap, 125, 130 million in cash, going to do 75 million in EBITDA. So it's not that, not that expensive. It is the AI play for data in sports that has the NFL each premier league. I'll leave it at that. But there's been a cast on the stock away from the markets just because there's been a large seller who just finally sold a huge stake and they're down below 10% finally. So that's a name that I would buy on weakness that has come into the entire sector, GENI. But I'm still very bullish on the sector overall. There's not many sector growth areas in this economy that are going to be producing this type of tax revenue, I believe, for the country. So. On this reversal day, as we mentioned, again, this is Thursday as we're taping Friday as you're listening. DraftKings is positive, and this stock, Dan Nathan, quickly has been lower left to upper right since December of 2022 when it was, as you say, a very large hat size. So I still think there's room in the space. Now, before we go to the great Ben Callow, either one of you have anything you'd like to get off your mind regarding <laughs> Tesla before we get into what will be a very interesting conversation. Dan, you first. Uh, you know, listen, you know, again, if you are sick of us talking about Tesla, there was a couple things. The fundamental story was an important one. It was a big technology narrative, right? It was about AI before we started talking about generative AI. That was full self-driving. It was about this the transformation of the you know, electric grid. It was, you know, how all of these, you know, ice manufacturers were going to be forced to kind of go the way of Tesla. It was going to be about China. It was going to be about low ends. It was going to be about robo taxis. It was like a lot of really big highfalutin tech narratives were wrapped up into the story, not to mention the cult following that Elon Musk has, right? And then if you want to go, I mean, Danny's detailed this for three years on the show, um, corporate governance. I mean, the list goes on and on and on, right? There was, it had a little something for everybody. And the fact of the matter is the story has come undone, in my opinion. Could it get worse? Of course. Could it, it get incrementally better? Sure. And, and I probably see a long-term horizon where this company probably starts to get some things right. I said it on Fast Money, guy, the, the night we were talking about that delivery disaster that they did. I said, it's interesting that you know, Elon Musk, who's been universally anointed, um, the best CEO this world has ever seen, you know what I mean? Like, um, has actually made some massive, massive errors over the last few years about how he's run this company, both on a micro level and from a macro perspective, in my opinion. So that's why this story has been fascinating to me. I think that's why we've talked about it a lot. Um, and so, you know, so, so that's it. And then some of the other things that you think we harp on a lot, I have a, I'm just going to tell you this. I, I think we're <laughs> going to end up being right about the narratives about the thing, but you can be wrong on price. You can be right on fundamentals and it hurts, but you know what? That's what makes a podcast people, because we're not here trying to take your money to run a hedge fund or be your financial advisor or anything like that. So I'll kick it over to you, Danny, because I know that you've been fascinated with the story and you've been very active in it for years. Yeah. And I've, you know, Ben's done a great job. He came out a couple of weeks ago, previewing how bad Q1 could be, even going into Q2 in terms of deliveries, what that could look like and knows that there's issues. The one analyst I have an issue with is Adam Jonas at Morgan Stanley, which everybody kind of knows he's been the outspoken bull. 
kind of on the name and non, non-apologetic. Well, let me just be clear where he is now with his numbers that he's come out. And he made a very interesting comment. He is now, if I'm not mistaken, on an earnings, on a gap earning 66 cents for 2024 and a buck 58 for 2025. But here's what's interesting, Dan. Auto sales in 2023, the auto sales line for Tesla were around $82 million is what came in. He is now, Adam Jonas, at 77, sorry, billion, $77 billion uh, now. For, so you think about that number going down. And in 2025, down to 90. But here's his quote. Here's his quote, which I take total issue with. We believe Tesla has significant attributes to be valued as an AI beneficiary, but the company must see a stabilization in the negative earnings revision within the auto business first. We do not believe that Tesla will get credit as an AI company as long as its core auto earnings are being revised down. What? So is he saying basically they've lost credibility with the investment community because the auto business has it treated? Because one should really, at the end of the day, have nothing to do with the other. So my point is that now people are grasping for excuses on what it may be. Well, it would have been a good AI story and you could have believed in it if auto line had done better. So my point is, it's, it's all bullshit. So the, his, I mean, Jonas's auto valuation, I think is $62 per share, whatever it might be. So again, Ford up 12 and percent for the year, GM up 25% for the year. We told people you want auto exposure, go buy those guys at the end of 2023. We said, you want tech, go buy one of these tech high flyers instead of dealing your point, Dan, about this, what has really become a mess. So it's turned into a show me story. And for people that basically, if you, if you still own Tesla, God bless you, you know, hope it works out for you. You do not own it for fundamental reasons right now. Okay. Because if you, you cannot own this for fundamental reasons. And so I'm still short. I'm still there. We'll see how it plays out. But, uh, we had a great conversation with Ben. So people should hang around for that. This was an animated conversation and I enjoyed it a great deal. I hope you folks did as well, but I'd like you to stick. I encourage you to stick around Yeah. because after this very short break, We'll have a conversation with the aforementioned Ben Callow from R.W. Baird. See you on the other side. <laughs> 